Victor, welcome to the show. Mav, thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. Where do we find you today? In a very hot uh, high rise flat in London, uh, the UK. You know, I miss London. Last time I was there, we held a meetup in uh, a couple great pubs, as you want to do in London town. And the vibe at the time was all about Brexit. And nobody knew anything from anyone else. They were all confused. There seemed to be no, <laughs> no, no outcome. What's, what's the vibe like in, uh, in, uh, in the UK right now? Well, it's all about the pandemic and the lockdown now. Uh, for regarding Brexit, I, I think we are marginally less confused, but I think a lot of that still remained. Uh, I mean, definitely impacted our industry, right? Uh, finance, uh, but I mean, yes, the, the, the pandemic totally overrode that. And we've been under very serious lockdown since basically March, a little bit of episodic uh, easing in the summer. But since November, like everyone was at home, you, you could not go anywhere. So mm. yeah, that, that's the vibe. It's opening up now. So you would see people hanging out in like big stores. Everyone's fed up uh, with the lockdown. People are going to pubs, uh, lots of people on the streets. A uh, little bit Mediterranean vibe because it's like 26 degrees Celsius here. Yeah. Well, um, you didn't always get your start in London. Uh, I think the circuitous path involved a little bit of Eastern Europe, as well as some time at the Googleplex before starting free trade. Give us the quick uh, origin story, how you ended up where you are. <laughs> the origin story, yeah. Eastern Europe, indeed. So I was born in Hungary. Uh, that was part of the Eastern Bloc when I was born. 1979, if you believe that. <laughs> that, that was a long time ago. Um, and uh, I actually spent my first 10 years under under communism. So I, I have very vivid memories. I was even a pioneer, uh, you know, just kind of like a Boy Scout, but Soviet style. Um, then the whole thing came crashing down, uh, which was a pretty, uh, pretty tremendous experience, to be honest. Um, and then the 90s, big societal upheaval, um, kind of like everyone was kind of kind of poor, you know, like just reflecting back on it, like, I would not even know what investing was. You know, no one would know my family or, or you know, anything like that. Entrepreneurship was kind of like very, very much uh, primordial. No one really was doing that a little bit, maybe. Um, and in 2004, we joined the EU. Um, so that's that's when I finished university, and um, it it was a really interesting situation because you could go and work in any of three countries: the United Kingdom, Ireland or Sweden, uh, these were the first countries. And now you can work without permission um, in, in basically in any EU country. But I was like, that's fantastic. I li really like Ireland. I want to spend maybe a year abroad that turned into like 15 later. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and I was really interested in tech. So all my peers at the university, they, they wanted to go into banks. It was all about finance. And that's where they ended up. And I was like, this whole internet thing is it's it's really awesome you know maybe i can i can do something related so i discovered that um a, a lesser known um tech company uh, lesser known by european standards called google opened an office in dublin so i applied i had maybe like 10 interviews at the time it was um, pretty unstructured and then they hired me so i basically packed all, all my belongings into a duffel bag uh, everything fit and then i flew to dublin that was my first time first time there and uh, i joined google and uh, i basically spent seven years there i built my career there and i had a great time so that, that's why i got my start um it was it was really interesting because all my peers that um ended up working with banks we know what happened in 2008 so that was it, that, that was a really interesting time. Google obviously did really well. Um, and then after then, I, um, you know, I felt after seven years, I, I still have had a lot to learn, but my learning plateaued. I, I went to Asia. I lived there for a while. I did an MBA, came back to London, uh, sorry, to Europe, and then to London for personal reasons. Um, and I was kind of unemployed. I, I guess you can say that. I mean, consulting and whatnot. But then I saw an advertisement on the tube, um, uh, and that was the platform Crowdcube, uh, which is um, equity crowdfunding. So I was like, this is fantastic. You can invest like basically any amount. You don't have to have hundreds of thousands of pounds. 
to invest in a, in a startup. You don't have to have your own solicitor. Um, you can basically go ahead and put money in a startup and you know the platform takes care of everything. So I invested in the very, very first crowdfunding round of Monzo, the very first crowdfunding round of Revolut, which is probably a little bit more familiar uh, for, for your US audience. Monzo is more like a, I guess, a chime type of neobank. And my third investment was the most important, uh, which was free trade. Th that was the first um, crowdfunding round that uh, now my co-founder and CEO, Adam, did basically put a pitch deck together, put it on Crowdcube. And I was like, this is fantastic. I, I moved to the UK. I thought it would be a very sophisticated financial market. Uh, I was looking for, to be honest, for a local equivalent of Robin Hood. I think we, we all have this generational experience of having been on the bait list, only later figuring out it's only, you know, for the US, for, for a US customer base. So I was like, this is, this is fantastic. Um, and uh, I basically looked across all my bank accounts uh, across Ireland, Hong Kong, where I lived as well, pulled all my money into the UK and I invested everything I had. So I was left maybe with like 15 pounds until the end of the month. Uh, thankfully, my girlfriend was employed. So I wasn't at, <laughs> at risk of becoming homeless, but basically I put all the money I had into free trade. Then um, Adam reached out to me or I reached out to him. I can't remember, but we hit it off. I really liked him. And, and uh, one thing led to another and, and I joined him uh, to build free trade as his marketing guy uh, originally. Um, so yeah, that, that, was, that was quite a journey. Yeah, so I, I love the concept of... Uh finding this product investing and then you know <laughs> then liking it so much you decide to join the actual uh company what what would what year was this kind of when you started doing the investing as far as the timeline uh for uh the crowdfunding 2016 the summer of okay. 2016 was very hot when it comes to crowdfunding that's when kind of like a really large fintechs uh, crowdfunded in london um and i joined free trade yeah, basically at them in 2017 so about uh okay so within the last five years all right so um we'll come back to crowdfunding later because i'm a little curious what this the state of affairs there is now uh but tell us what free trade is like what do you see about this concept and idea that really uh got you uh got you excited yeah free trade is a commission free brokerage um so we provide um stocks um UK and American stocks as well, and ETFs, and people can invest commission free. Uh, we have um, all the local accounts you can wish for in the UK. We have an ISA account, which is probably similar to maybe a 401k or a Roth IRA type of uh, tax shelter account um, in the US. Um, we charge a, a flat three pounds per month uh, for that. And we have uh, self-invested personal pensions, which is a uh, uh, basically what's what's on the team uh, it's a it's a pension account and, and you choose to invest your own pension uh, which is a fantastic structure as well it comes with some uh, tax relief as well so that's what we provide and we continuously develop the product and uh, we are uh, in the coming months we are expanding into sweden as our first interna international market and then the rest of europe later this year talk to me a little bit about um we'll get into kind of brokerages in general, but uh, you know, there tends to be, at least in, in my understanding, some fairly stark differences between uh, what the investing landscape looks like in Europe than in the U S uh, and then forget about other countries too. I mean, I often will complain ad nauseum about costs in the U S and then my friends from Canada or Japan or wherever would be like, dude, you haven't seen anything. <laughs> you know, these, some of these uh, are South America. They're like, you're complaining about some of these costs, my God. So tell me a little bit about kind of just the general European market. And then uh, we can kind of dive down specifically a little more what you guys are doing and how things are structured. Yeah, absolutely. As a, as a starting point, investing in Europe historically, was not really mainstream per se. It's more part of the culture in the US and culturally, I think um, Americans are more willing to take some risks and willing to lose some uh, capital. Europeans tend to be more risk averse culturally. Um, so there is that kind of backdrop. Um, however, around like five years ago with 
the free trade, we had this vision that um, an investing account is going to be as almost as mainstream as having a bank account, uh, a checking account, really normal. And the reason we, we believe that was just where the, where the world has been heading. Um, so, you know, I mean, some of your some of your guests can can explain this even better than me, but uh, it's like there is not many places where you can put your money. Um, basically, you know, um, how interest rates uh, and inflation looks like. You are basically uh, up until very recently, you uh, you are paid a premium just being long on equities, and um, that that's where the growth is, and that's where um, growth is coming from. Virtually all of it, uh, companies innovating, becoming more effective, inventing things. Um, and in terms of the market in Europe, it, it was not really easy to invest. Uh, some, of the, uh, some of the incumbents in, in the UK, they are really expensive. And that's typical in the European market as well. You would pay for one transaction, something like 12 pounds. That's probably 15, 16 dollars, if my mental math is correct. Uh, maybe even even more depending where the where the um, exchange rate is. Um, it, it's it's really expensive, and that's been the norm up until very recently. And and that's been the norm in basically almost any other virtually all all European markets. Very very expensive. Um, same in Japan and Canada, like you would hear from your from your friends. But but we thought that there is a generational change, um, so people need to do something with their with their money. Um, th there is money in Europe, so there are really developed um, rich countries and basically a hundred million uh, people market, and they need to find a way to put that money to work. So that's been that's been our thesis. Our thesis was that we are basically at the at the precipice of of, of all this change, and we can be a company that that drives this change and is at the focal point of this of of this change, um, so saving chance and all that stuff that's that's stuff of history for us you would not you would not really receive any meaningful return we are talking like literally 0.01 percent kind of return that you would you would get uh with some savings accounts and so when you guys got started um you know the name is pretty clear what is sort of like the uh was was this the sort of state of affairs where you guys were the totally new only entrant in this world of sort of commission free? Was it something where, uh, you know, everyone's doing it now? H how was the sort of progression of what you guys launched and the, the uptake of it? When, when we launched, uh, we were basically the only ones uh, doing this. And uh, it's becoming uh, more and more mainstream, not quite with the incumbents, but we see Kind of like small upstarts popping up um, and uh, you know offering um, ESG focused ETFs uh, for um, uh, commission fee or uh, you know having like topical focuses. So it's becoming more mainstream. But uh, when we started, it's almost like borderline. We were not taken seriously. People just would not believe that people will actually invest. But we have almost eight hundred thousand signed up users right now. So close to a million. So I guess the story is um, developing our way. You know, and so the <clears throat> interesting idea in my mind too is that the environment, and you can correct me, um, you know, US stock market has been in somewhat of a romping, stomping bull for the past decade, for the most part. You've had some some jiggles in the in the interim, but for the most part, largely outperforming other markets. UK hasn't really been that sort of experience. So are most of your investors uh, investing locally and they investing globally? Or are they all trading US stocks? What's the sort of composition? That's, a, that's actually a very interesting question because yes, like you said, US market romping and stomping. That's, and, um, and it's incredible how popular US stocks are across Europe. You know, you would maybe expect that, um, you know, European countries, they you know, maybe German people would be interested in like French stocks, but based on our survey and data, that's not necessarily the case. But what we do see is home market bias. So about 50% of our customer base uh, or um, our customer base, 50% of their investment on average is in uh, local UK um, investments, UK stocks. 
and uh, the other 50 percent in in us and they just have this connection with local companies that they you know whose products they use every day uh, that's our thesis that's why um they invest and you know there are some success stories in in the uk uh, the FTSE 100 is not necessarily a success story itself i mean recently it's been doing actually quite okay but historically it's not an amazing outstanding investment but there are some companies that are unknown gems in the uk and local people actually understand which ones tend to be higher performing um, companies so <clears throat> kind of get into the meat of the discussion now thinking about what you guys do talk to me a little bit about your business model how a brokerage like free trade is structured um in uh in your juris your jurisdiction versus uh the kind of the typical and then we can branch off into all sorts of different offshoots from that right um so something very important to understand when it comes to the european markets that um capital markets are not as competitive as in the US, which me means that everything is more expensive. Like, you know, running a type of business like free trade in the US would be much cheaper. Um, and early on, we figured out that um, the, the best way to decrease our costs is going direct to the source and connect to the plumbing of the capital markets more directly. So something we invested early on was uh, our invest platform, um, which is our own uh, clearing engine. Um, and uh, it basically does the uh, brokerage uh, heavy lifting, um, which means that we are not relying on a third party when it comes to core brokerage uh, activities. Um, but it took one and a half years and 10 engineers to develop it. I mean, it's still, it's like incredible. I mean, heads up, heads up to the team. Um, it's just, it meant that it's a trade-off. We could not deliver new features until that was done. So we had to do this like large upfront investment uh, to really get started. And before that, actually, we, you know, we, 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 we always called ourselves free trade, but actually the, the instant order was uh, one pound before we, before we introduced our own platform so to, to, to cover our costs. So now the trades are commission free. Um, and uh, in terms of our business model, we make, uh, the bulk of our um, revenue currently from FX. So when uh, someone, you know, all, all our customers are in the UK, they have a sterling based um, account. When they buy a US stocks, then we exchange uh, uh, their uh, currency from sterling to, to US dollars. So we charge a, a, a modest 45 bips on that. And uh, that's uh, part of our revenue, but we don't want to depend on that. So we have multiple revenue sources. The second one is subscriptions. So I mentioned the ISO account, which is a tax sheltered uh, investment account, uh, tax efficient. That's uh, three pounds per month. And we really love the kind of like how high quality this like monthly re recurring revenue is. It's really, you know, with the FX that goes up, up and down, depending on, you know, there is a big meltdown in the US markets. We see our customers investing a lot more uh, than, you know, prices greater. Uh, but but that varies, but um, subscription is very sad for us. And uh, the other source of revenue, which is currently not really resulting in a lot of money, would be uh, interest on uh, uninvested cash of our customers. But uh, the Bank of England decides um, how high the interest rate is, and it's not very high right now. Yeah, I mean, if you look at historical brokerage like Charles Schwab, you know, they get, and you can correct me because I'm sure you know more than I do, but ballpark, if I recall, it's like half from that interest spread and then all the various other things kind of mixed in, you know, versus uh, a more in the news competitor like a Robinhood, which gets it largely from uh, payment for order flow and kind of margin lending. Are those two categories you guys implement as well or are those categories that I think is, correct me if I'm wrong, the Europe is, is payment for overflow straight up illegal or, or not allowed? It is. That, that's our interpretation of the rules uh, that it's illegal to do payment for order flow. Uh, we reached out to the, to the regulator as well to, uh, 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 to get um, a better interpretation and clarification of the, of the rule. We, we are actually not... Um, uh, uh, we are not allowed to do that, but we also don't find that that um, that that uh, business uh, model 
is actually something that we we would ever want to introduce on our customers. We we disagree with the philosophy uh, behind that. We we think there are conflicting interests when it comes to people. And uh, in terms of margin lending, so early on we decided that we want to create a product that's that's healthy for our customers. Our our goal is uh, to help them create a healthy long term investing habit, as opposed to you know chime in you know, bet on the meme stocks, kind of like gambling type of behavior. That's not something we want. So we decided not to do margin lending at all because we consider it, you know, something that only very sophisticated people should use. And free trade is not the best product for that. So yeah. we decided that we will ne never implement uh, margin. So does that mean people can, uh, can't trade uh, options? They can trade options. You know, I've been very vocally critical of, of Robin Hood. And I, uh, I spend a lot of time trying to reflect and say, look, you know, I think a lot of these companies, and I'll put acorns in the same bucket, you know, I say a lot of companies, um, I reserve the right to be wrong. And it's complicated, because in some way, it brings a lot of investors that may not have entered the investing world into the investing world, but also it enters them, in my opinion, through the wrong door, meaning, you know, they learn all the wrong lessons and get incentivized to do all the bad things. Now, maybe they'll uh, sort of graduate from that experience with a lot of scars and understanding of how sort of the world works, but also, you know, the gold standard in the US, I consider to be Vanguard. Uh, in a world where you could invest in Vanguard, it would have been nice just to go there in the first place excluding um, obviously what we're doing. And so the problem I always have is, is driven so much by incentives, you know, and, and we say, look, if, if your broker is incentivizing you to do all these bad behaviors, you probably need a new broker or you need a new partner. It's the same in life. You know, if your um, friends or family members are leading you towards the path that you don't want to be on, you know, it's a hard decision to make, but the reality is that you probably you need to reflect and just get a different <laughs> get to get a different partner. Um, Absolutely. I imagine you have uh, a fair amount of perspective on the past year in markets and what's been going on. I mean, I thought 2020 was a, a particularly crazy time and then 2021 just rolls in and says my you haven't seen nothing yet uh particularly with a lot of the interest in the wall street bets community and others on meme stocks and there's the, the struggle i have so much is that the the media there's so many competing narratives many of which are, are misleading and wrong and so uh it's good to have someone like yourself who, who knows a lot more about the guts of what's going on What's been your general perspective on the past year? I'll let you take that in any direction you want, but there's been right. certainly a lot of a lot going on. All right, I hope I hope you have time. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I mean that was a pivotal year, right? And I mean, let's also reflect on what you know, what kind of incentives uh, the media has, right? When when they narrate what happened in the past twelve months plus, right? They are going to you know focus on kind of like the most rebetting, most crazy stuff and, uh, you know, take take it out of proportion. I'm not saying that, you know, what happened with the meme stuff is not significant but and dramatic as well, but I would put it in perspective. So the pandemic and what it caused, it, it basically blasted us forward maybe like a decade easily in various ways. Like in the, in the UK, I mean, e-commerce was already very developed, but I mean, now for everyone, it's pretty normal to order groceries, order, order food by, by their apps. And it absolutely had an impact on people starting to invest. And we looked into that. We, you know, we talk to our customers all the time. We, we send surveys. We have a user research team as well uh, talking to them. And basically what happened in our findings was that, well, people ended up with a quite a bit of free time and a quite quite a bit of money. You don't commute, you don't spend uh, on food outside. And investing is something that's been on the, on the to-do list of a lot of people to learn about. And honestly, a lot of people were bored as well. So that's kind of like the genesis of where that kind of like really large uptick in, 
in investing. That, that, that's how it looked like. And I mean, you know, the media kind of took it in a certain direction and focused on certain narratives. But whenever we survey our customer base, and that's, that's a really significant sample, significant population, I would say, uh, we find that most people are, are reasonable. They, they are focusing on pound cost averaging, dollar cost averaging type of behavior every month. They invest in ETFs. They have their conviction bets, like you know, people love their like green energy companies with, or kind of like the convictions they have about the future. And yes, like some people invest in in meme stocks and they definitely buy into the narratives they they see on Reddit. But that's we find that's the loud minority. But that's what really gets the limelight when it comes to narrating the past year, and that's not what we see. We also uh, run our own uh, online community forum, which we moderate. I think with Reddit, the kind of trouble is that it can be taken in lots of very wild, very cowboy directions. And we as a company, we are um, authorized and regulated by the FCA, the, the local regulator. So every material that we put out, a website, um, an online forum, it, it's subject to certain standards and expectations. So we moderate uh, you know, giving like a straight up investment recommendation, you can do that, you can provide a, a target price. It's, it's very important when it comes to the online community that you can like monitor and moderate it correctly. So diverse thoughts uh, kind of like get shared as opposed to kind of like people hyping each other up. Um, I mean, you know, the other, the other aspect of, of what happened and meme stock as well, we, we actually really love the democratization that that went down. This is, this is actually absolutely in mission for us. We want everybody to have access to investing and everybody to, to develop this, this healthy habit. And in a way, this um, what happened in, in January, for example, it's like uh, pouring uh, fuel on the fire, right? It's, it's a trend that's already been going on. With the meme stock, it got a lot, lot more exposure. And as a result, a lot more people can get into this healthy habit. But yeah, there is that, um, you know, small minority that, um, you know, gambles um, and, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, human behavior. Some people, you know, want that, they enjoy the adrenaline, they post their loss porn on Reddit, you know, um, if some people go into that knowingly in an informed way, fine. Um, you know, there are people who go, who like going to a casino, kind of like putting everything on red, you know, that's fine. We should not like regulate that. But I think the media focused very much on on that. Um, we've also seen a lot of conspiracy theories, of course, like everyone else. Um, it's like, it's very important to communicate transparently and giving um, like a really good account of what's happening because the brokerage, like the technical aspect of running a brokerage is actually quite arcane and complex. And it's like a really good, you know, soil to like see um, conspiracy theories, right? Which are not really helpful uh, for a society. I, I, I don't think. I think an informed uh, society is, is much better. But yeah, all in all, it's, it's been an incredible year for us, and we gained a lot of customers, and most of them invest very sensibly. That that would be my summary. Yeah, and so I think a lot of the narratives got parts of the discussion wrong when Robinhood and others had to kind of shut down and pause. Was that something you guys had to experience too? I imagine um, there was a, a pretty large uptick in interest and demand from retail investors wanting to set up accounts and trade. Uh, did you guys go through the same experience or if not, what was it like? We went through some very wild experiences. So we uh, did, did, not, did not go through this without having to, having to um, shut down the market temporarily for a little bit. Um, it, it was actually really wild because I went on uh, Sky TV um, live news, I, I think on a Friday morning on, on January. And I was saying things like, you, you know, that we absolutely believe and, uh, and we absolutely do, which is we are on the side of the, of the retail investor. We are not going to shut down uh, the market arbitrarily. And, you know, I, I, I finished the interview. I went back to, you know, I, uh, I opened work, you know, Slack. And I get a message from our VP of product that, hey, our FX, um, our FX uh, provider that helps us, um, you know, providing the FX exchange, they just told us that they have to limit our bandwidth by 90%. So they want to kind of like put us back to where we were like, I don't know, 12 months ago. So I was like, what? 
<laughs> you know, like, where is this coming from? And it, it was a really intense day because, you know, I, I made this statement. We all, as a company, have been making these statements. And we ended up having to shut down buys uh, that day uh, of US stocks. Uh, um, and we had to explain that to our customers. And, and the path we chose was like kind of navigating this kind of like very narrow space of not bad mousing your partners. You know, we, we thought it was fair for them to be able to explain themselves and for us, you know, for us all to take time to understand why, we, you know, we were limited that much, but also like very transparently going to our community, to our customers and saying that, well, we have to do this. This is caused by our FX partner. And this is the logic. This is what we, this is our guiding principle, which is treat customers fairly. It's, it's, it's a principle that the FCA um, uh, demands us to follow, but it's also something that we innately follow. We want to treat our customers fairly always. And we felt blocking buys and prioritizing sales. So you were able to get out of a position if you wanted to, it was just, the right sort of trade-off for us but it, it was a very tough sort of thing to manage and we had a lot of twitter messages and i, I still have probably like hundreds of hundred twitter dms mm -hmm. from various ra random people who want wanted this to you know stop we were you know telling me their version of the conspiracy theory um that sort of stuff but all, all in all we managed to communicate transparently and uh, and get through this um together with the team and then we spent the whole weekend uh, implementing the technological solution for the FX limitation. Our engineers implemented a way to bulk, to, to batch FX orders. Uh, so on, on Monday, we were able to open, we were, we were open for business again. But yeah, that was a very intense weekend for sure. You know, I think part of the challenge with everything comes down to structure. You know, I, I think the concept of payment for order flow, short lending revenue, um, you know, it, it, uh, it's unclear to a customer how traditionally brokerages make money on all these different routes. And the cool thing potentially, and I haven't used y'all service, but you know, the, this concept of the subscription model, um, you know, allows you to kind of take a step back. And, and I think of the same way as a RIA or a fiduciary in the US where you're by law supposed to work in the customer's best interest and, and to really take out all the, the stops. And so, you know, that I was saying on Twitter numerous times and feel free to comment. Um, I said, look, if you're gonna do payment for order flow, if you're gonna do short lending, like we do on the institutional level, we give it all back. I was like, why not set it up where kind of like what you guys do, but say, look, we'll at least share it with the customer. Say like, we'll give you half, which some brokerages I think do on the short lending. I don't know any that do on the payment for order flow, but it has this, it's, a, it's like a whole totally different mindset of if you had two Venn diagrams, you know, one is every decision is driven by, is this in the customer's best interest and can we still stay in business? And on the other is like, how much money can we make from this person? And it's like, everything is influenced after that initial cultural sort of, you know, mindset. Does that yeah. make any sense? Got any thoughts? No, no, absolutely. Um, you use the word structure, which, which, is, which I think is very important because you want to set up your business in a way that is structured. It's, people are incentivized uh, to do things in the best interest of customers. Um, like historically, you know, I personally, I guess all of us have been used and abused by financial services companies in the past, at least, you know, definitely how I feel, uh, the way I feel about many of my, m m many of the <laughs> financial services firms I've been, I've been customers so, of. So, and that's the promise of FinTech, right? The, with the commoditization of technology, we are able to build new generation companies that prioritize customers that put customer interests, uh, first and, and foremost and that's a very easy thing to say the meat of it is really structuring your company and setting incentives uh, so that everything that you do is aligned according to the best interest of the customer that's why subscription for example that is the best source of revenue for us uh, so we um, 
we actually have a premium account called Plus, uh, where you get an extended stock universe and um, uh, different order types like limit orders, stop losses, and that's 10 pounds per month. And we continuously develop that account. We are adding more and more features because we want to build something that people feel is worth paying for. And once we have that, that's really high quality revenue, right? That's, that's monthly re recurring revenue or, or, or yearly recurring revenue event uh, with, a, with a discount. That's, that's fantastic because, you know, we are incentivized to work for the customer, make the account better. We work hard to make sure we retain those customers and they continuously find um, value in that account type. That's, that's really what we focus on. And it's not like we don't want to diversify our revenue sources. You always want to stand on multiple legs, right? So we, we, we are looking at um, uh, stock lending as well. And, uh, you know, our, our CEO, Adam, he, he's ridiculously customer oriented. So his thinking is like from the get go, can we find a way, at least for our plus members, to share that revenue with them and make it opt-in or or something like that? It's you know we want to we want to have that revenue and like absolutely we just want to do it in a way that we are incentivized to get it the right way if that makes sense in a way that we don't harm our customers. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you guys have learned. You know, you've been doing this for five years and um, I imagine you said almost a million customers. So uh, you've probably had every possible customer interaction 10 times over, but, you know, as far as best practices on, on design, you know, I think um, some of the conclusions often are, are not necessarily intuitive. Uh, you know, the example I used to talk about was um, on like notifications for a client, uh, you know, and some groups want a ton of education and input and others are like, wait, I should be worried about market volatility. Like I wasn't even looking at my account. Now you tell me I should be looking, you know, so what have you guys learned over the last five uh, years? Best practices, things you did wrong, things uh, you think are, are been useful? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there have been a number of things that we, that we did wrong and a number of things we actually managed to blast out of water and both of them are great sources of, of learning and yeah like you said every sort of customer interaction 10 times over one of the one of the sort of learnings is is a little bit unusual and i think your us audience might might find it like like really really unusual is, is just the power of crowdfunding which is like our original growth loop was and every company wants to have a growth loop you want to have a way to kind of like, you know, like a feedback loop of how you develop your devoted customer base. We actually made them shareholders in the company, uh, which was made possible by how well it's structured in the UK. I understand in the US until maybe a couple of years ago, you had to be like a high net worth individual uh, to invest in, in these kind of raises, but it's fairly normal in the UK. You get even like tax cuts when you invest in startups. Like as a retail investor, you get 30% off, um, 50% off in the form of tax relief if you invest in, in startups. So we, 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 we leaned into that. Um, and then th that was the seed of our community. And, and we learned like how important that community is because you want people advocating for you, even though, you know, it's ridiculously hard to build a brokerage, it turns out <laughs> fine. You know, uh, we sort of knew, but uh, an outcome of that is that when we get started, we have to prioritize what feature, what design, um, you know, we choose to go with. And we started with a very low cost uh, version, no pun intended, of, of the app, very simple. And it was very useful to have these community of people who were very forgiving and gave us a chance and gave us product feedback, like very direct product feedback. Um, when it comes to design and, you know, the push notifications that, that you mentioned, I, yeah, I think what, 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 we, what we always learn is like only bother people with value that you create for them. Like a lot of times companies mindset is like, oh, I need to reach this objective. I, I, I want to make revenue. And that sort of filters into what they do and what kind of push notifications they send and, and how they design the product. I mean, you want to optimize, but you always, you know, have to keep in mind, like, am I creating value for my customer? The, the way I, I'm reaching them, is it like, you know, uh, a type of communication that they actually derive value from. So that's very important. And we invested a lot in 
like education as well, um, like like you referred to. But yeah, people are different, and not everyone necessarily wants kind of like blog post type of content in the app about what an ETF is. So what we learned is, and that's something we want to do better in the in the future is like you want to understand your customers really really well. You want to build a CRM uh, system that that classifies your customer exactly. You know, there are people who just like start out investing, they try with 20 pounds. That's fairly different from the person who transfers their 100,000 pound portfolio and they exactly know what they are doing. These are different customers and we want to understand them better going forward and, and create different experiences for them. So yeah, that's, um, that's definitely something we learned. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of my early days uh beliefs about investing have, have changed over the years you know one of the which is um you know sort of this concept of illiquidity or you know nudges to keep you from yourself you know the challenge of uh whether it's over trading or um mucking around with an investing plan based on emotions and what the markets are doing Let's talk a little bit about the future. Uh, you guys been at it for half a decade. You got another long runway to go as we look out on the horizon of the 2020s. What's, uh, what's, what's on the to-do list? Well, a lot is on the to-do list. The main thing is uh, making free trade truly global. Um, so it's like, you know, great to, to be in the UK. It, it's a great business. We will definitely you know, we definitely see ourselves on a trajectory to achieve great outcomes as a, as a company. But really, the mission is to get everyone investing. And that means everyone. So what, what will define the next half a decade or entire decade is, is going into these different countries and going the right way. Um, so we use uh, Sweden as sort of a learning ground to learn internationalizations the right way. And we, we want to make the app fairly local. We already see that making it like fully, absolutely local is very, very difficult and challenging. So we have to do trade-offs, but, but that's what's going to define, define the future. It's not just Sweden, but using those learnings going into the other EU countries as well. And then eventually go into countries like Australia, where we already established a small engineering team uh, and they are working on, um, on a secret project, a feature that hopefully we'll be able to announce soon and we want to go to Asia and we want to go to North, North America as well. Um, so that's what's going to define the, define the next, uh, next decade. And that's like way bigger than any individual feature. It, the most important thing is that we remain structured the same way, which is our incentives are aligned uh, with our customers, our, our customers outcome. That, that's the most important thing. And, and getting to scalability globally, that's, uh, that's the future for us. Yeah. Um, as we look at sort of the, the future of, of retail investing, and by the way, I was trying to see if you guys had freetrade.com. You guys own that domain or somebody else got it? <laughs> oh, somebody else got it. Uh, an American uh, brokerage actually, but they don't use it. So, um, uh, you know. well, if you're listening, you own freetrade.com. Let's, uh, reach out. Victor may, uh, may have an offer for you of, uh, a six pack of pints of British beer and, and um some uh lager. <laughs> yeah some loggers um so what other trends are taking shape on the con like do you think uh the culture of traditionally opaque higher fees like is that is there a groundswell support because you know often I'll, I'll travel to other countries and am consistently surprised at the lack of sort of um disruption that's happening you know still uh, is it something that you think is, are you seeing other fractures and changes in the entire ecosystem or is it sort of early days? Cause in the U S it's like, I feel like it's extremely competitive, but, yeah. uh, what else? So do you think it's going to be very competitive, um, everywhere else as well? We are already seeing disruption happening in Europe and, uh, we are one of the leaders of that, but it's still somewhat early days. There are markets that are huge and still there is not a lot of disruption. If you consider Spain, for example, that, that's a really large European market or, or even Italy. 
and there is nothing there. So we are hoping that, um, and what we are planning for is that we are going to be the company that that um, leads the leads the disruption there. But it's early days, and it's so competitive and advanced in the U.S. We are probably maybe a decade behind that, and we are definitely planning to be the company that leads that that dis disruption from like Norway to Italy to to Russia to to Ireland, and and eventually outside of outside of Europe as well. Um. I'd love to hear now, uh, you know, coming full circle, you talked in the beginning about being an investor and then joining the company. Talk to us a little bit about the actual crowdfund experience. Um, you know, was that, are there rules where there's like a minimum uh, accreditation there or can you invest like a hundred pounds? How much did you raise? How many people? All that good stuff. Yeah, absolutely. It's actually one of those fantastic things I discovered when I when I moved here to the UK, uh, to London. I actually did not realize there was a sophisticated crowdfunding, equity crowdfunding market. Because when you say crowdfunding, right, in, in most other markets, uh, particularly in the US, I, I think you might associate that with like uh, Kickstarter, right? And that, that's a completely different thing. Um, uh, uh, crowdfunding for, for equity is, is definitely uh, advanced in the UK. And there, there are two main platforms. Uh, one is Crowdcube, the other one is Cedars. In fact, they, they recently tried to merge. They tried, tried to become the one and same company. And uh, I think the competition authority in the UK um, uh, did not approve that. Um, but it's two very meaningful players in the market who are doing amazing things. As a, as a customer, as, a, as an investor, uh, you sign up on the platform. You actually have to go to some level of certification. You have to go through the risk disclaimers. You have to acknowledge that you know what you are doing. It's basically sort of a suitability test where you kind of like have to you know, indicate that, yeah, you understand that you might lose all of your money and most startups don't work out and all that sort of stuff. So, so these platforms make sure you don't go in there blindly. And typically what you can do is invest like as little as 10 pounds, which is like, of maybe uh, 14 uh, US dollars. So th that's a very low low amount. And I mean, you know, we, we see very various kind of like levels of investment. We, we did six crowdfunding to date. We are going to, to do a seven, by the way, in uh, wow. September. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy. Th this time we are going to make it uh, Europe wide. So it's been very UK focused, but this time around when we do it, we are going to, we are, uh, we are going um, we, are, we are going to make sure that people in Sweden, Germany, France, all these people have access to it and, and know about it and all that. But, but yeah, the, the entry bar barrier is not uh, very high. That, that 10, 10 pound is, is not particularly high amount. Um, and and th there have been you know, various outcomes for um, investors, right? And you know, these are startups, so there have been um, busts. There have been companies that did not work out. And the media, of course, as it usually does, it picks up those stories and wrangles every drop of, you know, horrifying uh, stories out of it uh, as much as possible. And there have been great outcomes. Um, so my original investment in Monzo and Revolut, they, they went incredibly well. My original investment in Free Trade went incredibly well. And we actually minted mi like literal millionaires, people who invested in the first crowdfunding round. I think there were maybe five of them Whose uh, share of holding because they invested a big enough amount, uh, they actually it became a, a million pound or more. Wow! And so, um, what, how much have you guys raised in aggregate? In aggregate, uh, I believe we raised. Uh, so we raised, in in the most recent crowdfunding we raised uh, thirty five million pounds, and before that. Uh, 24, so, so uh, wow. around 55, 60 million uh, 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 pounds altogether. That's awesome. And, and uh, I, I may have slightly missed it, but you said there's no, they, you don't have to have a, net, a, a minimum net worth. You just got to kind of go through like a, a online or educational process. Exactly. You don't have to have a minimum net worth. You yeah. have to certify you, you have to you know platforms make sure that you understand what you are getting into something i neglected to say map though um 
is the tax relief um, here in the UK. So there are two schemes, the seed um, enterprise investment scheme and the enterprise investment scheme. This is basically, a, uh, I believe, 60 and 30% uh, um, uh, uh, tax relief that you, uh, that you receive uh, once you invest. So let's say um, you invest like 100 pounds in a EIS uh, company, um, uh, 30 pounds you, you can claim back once you do your self-assessment. Uh, so the, these, these are government uh, schemes that help startups. Yeah, the, um, you know, there's some similarities in the US and the, we talk a lot about the QSBS rules here. Listeners, if you don't know it, Google it, um, investing in startups. And I think everything is trending in the right direction for a long time. It was accredited only, but now you're starting to see a lot more of the uh, crowdfunding rules, uh, you know, going to place where people can invest the lower amounts. We've actually considered it. Um, the max I think you can raise here is five million. But um, what what was the main motivation for you guys? Was it more just you wanted to raise the money so you could build the business, or uh, how much of a role did having motivated stakeholders? Uh, play in this, you know, because I love this concept of the customers becoming equity holders too. I think that's a, a really cool because we have, I think, almost a hundred thousand investors now, and uh, and I think it's what a great way to let people kind of play along in the whole uh, whole 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 ride. Yeah, what motivated us majorly, and um, that was a what I think is a is a very good original decision from uh, from Adam Dots, our, our CEO and founder, is um, kind of like the high quality investor base you can get. I mean, you can take money from from VCs and they have certain terms, and you are kind of stuck with those people. And there are great VCs, and we have them in our investor base now, and we are really happy with them. It's just having the crowd. Um, it it sort of scales the impact. You can make it's it's partially marketing because suddenly you gain a lot of people that will be that will feel very passionate about your success sometimes in a way that's almost like unfair toward other, other companies they will favor you even if you know other companies have like a marginal better product um, they place their belief and they put money in in the company and that brand advocacy is is extremely valuable and very helpful and, and we are so thankful to have these people in our in our um, customer uh, in our investor base but also very often they are very interesting people with interesting skill set so what we did we actually very often hired people who invested um, in free trade and they have various skills it just really connects you with a, a large number of people and that has lots of lots of various benefits so that that was the original uh, thinking behind that decision to, you know, start creating that community you can re really rely on. And I think a lot of companies talk about community these days. Um, you know, they they talk a good game, but 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 really, like the best way to to create it is to make them co-owners of your company. That's that's the most powerful way. And then they are ridiculously incentivized, um, you know, to spread the word. Um, advocate the product and, and give you feedback and advice as well. And what we see as well, our, our toughest um, reviewers are our investors and community members. They are definitely upset if they don't like a feature. They, 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 you know, it's, it's sometimes really um, you know, tough conversations we have to manage in, the, in our community forum, but we are thankful for it. We, you know, the only way to become a really world-class company is, is having those sort of high expectations that somebody who is like really um, incentivized and really motivated um, for for free trade can, can give you. So there there are lots of benefits of it. Yeah, um, I'd like to see more of that. You know, this this sort of stakeholder capitalism to get people invested in the right way. Obviously, uh, not every investment will work out, and in the startup world, probably most won't work out. But I, I think the concept of uh, the framing, which is, you know, investing in businesses, uh, you know, is, is a nice uh, complement to the, the crazy, you know, day to day, hour to hour, minute, minute going on to the stock market. It lets you kind of sock away and, and, and have a long term perspective, which is hard to do in, in uh, this day and age. 
Victor, um, as you look back on your own personal career, what's been your most uh, memorable investment? My most memorable investment, I mean, um, free trade, definitely. I mean, yeah. we spent an episode on it, so I'm going to nominate another one. Um, I invested quite early on, um, I mean, as early as I could in Tesla, and I invested an unreasonable amount, but seemed like an unreasonable amount at the time. And the reason I did that was I just really hated the media sort of response around um, Elon Musk's, you know, whatever he's doing type of stuff, whether that's like, uh, you know, smoking a joint on the Joe yeah. Rogan experience or all that. That's, I, 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 I literally remember listening um, to that episode of Joe Rogan and, you know, they could get to that part and I uh, busted out my smartphone and I put more money into my Tesla. <laughs> <laughs> I, I knew that there, there was going to be an outcry. I kind of, you know, before I listened to the podcast, I, I you know, I saw the news site and all that. And, and I'm like, you know, it's just, you know, it's, it's the vision, right? It's um, the electrification of the future and, and having this really radical sort of mindset that, you know, you are not manufacturing, you know, hybrid vehicles all in on electrified uh, vehicles. I just really like those radical companies that don't do trade-offs quite a lot and, and visionary CEOs. Um, so yeah, I I invested maybe to the tune of like uh, ten thousand dollars, which which is which was really a, a huge amount. That seemed mm -hmm. like a huge amount the, uh, based on the volatility of the stock price. But I was kind of, you know, it, it was almost like an angry investment. I was like, I'm going to support this guy um, with as much money as I can, and um, it turned out to be a, an amazing investment. Yeah, he's been a world class entrepreneur. Um, that's for sure. You know, it's funny the Joe Rogan podcast. I was uh, used to be a heavy listener, but as soon as he moved to Spotify, because I use a different app, I, I just have totally forgotten to uh, keep track with his episodes. And um, I don't know if that'll be a long term situation or not, but it goes to show the kind of the importance of platform too. you know, some of these, uh, some of these content creators that that put up the gates or wall wall those down makes it uh be curious to know in retrospect if if he would think that's a good idea or not i don't know spotify yeah, app for me is not quite uh not quite there yet yeah i have my own uh pocket cast is, is what i use for app and and since, since you moved to spotify i have not listened to one episode and then i always see remember, oh, it, these are really great episodes um a really great show i, sh I should listen but yeah and i it's somehow i always get lost in the process i i never finish like at I think I should pay for it or something. And, you know, it's just, yeah, platform, like you said. Um, but yeah, yeah. You know, um, what happens in the future? Cool. Victor, uh, people want to find out more what you're up to, what you guys are doing. Uh, where do they go? Well, uh, freetrade.io, that's the website, and community.freetrade.io, that's the online discussion board that we run, that the, uh, basically the home of the community. And uh, we actually created a link for you, MAD, as well. I, I know most of your listeners are in the US, but freetrade.io slash MAD, M-E-B. So if anyone in the UK signs up to that link, they are going to get a free share, uh, oh. a little, little gift uh, from you and I, basically. Awesome. Uh, um, Victor, thanks so much. I've had a blast chatting with you today. And hopefully, knock on wood, get to share a pint in person soon. That will be awesome. Definitely let me know when you are around in London. <laughs>